Thank you so much. So how many of you had a chance to look at some of the pictures that I had? A lot of you, right? Slides looping up here. Aren't those just incredible? I've seen them so many times and I, I never get bored of them. You know, whenever I, whenever I make new slides, it always takes me so long to find just the right images that convey the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. But not when it comes to images depicting the natural connection so many of us have with animals. And especially the connection children have with animals. I always find way more than I can use. I mean, there are literally thousands of pictures out there that really capture that childlike sense of wonder that understanding, that, that caring. I can tell a lot of you can relate to this. Um, so because I'll be referring to this human-animal connection throughout this presentation, I'd like to do a brief exercise with you to explore it a bit more fully. I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you felt a connection to. And by connection, I mean anything from identifying with an animal or animals to loving them. I just mean caring about their well-being. Maybe it was the horse you took riding lessons on or the guinea pig in your elementary school classroom. Maybe it was a dog you grew up with or a hurt bird you rescued. Maybe it was a turtle or a fish. So now I want to take a poll. Raise your hand if you were able to think of at least one animal. Wow, okay. Raise your hand if you were able to think of at least two animals. Now raise your hand if you've ever felt cared about or loved by an animal. Now take a look around the room. That's a whole lot of love. And our experience tells us something important. We care about animals. We feel connected to them. We can see examples of this everywhere. I mean, we teach our children to be kind to animals, not to harm them. We make animals the heroes of our children's stories and the stars of their shows. When we're walking in the woods and we catch a glimpse of a deer through the trees, or when we see dolphins leaping out of the ocean, or when we notice a delicate butterfly resting on a flower, we often feel that sense of awe that makes us just stop and speak in hushed voices and watch with what some might even call reverence. When we hear of an abused animal, we recognize the injustice and we feel outraged. When we're at the petting zoo and the piglet chooses our hand to eat out of, we feel special, we get excited. Can you relate to this? I certainly can too. So before we get started, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my story and how I came to be here today. This is me a very long time ago and my dog Fritz. My mother tells me we adopted Fritz when he was about two months old and I was about two years old. So we were really both just babies when we met. Now, Fritz was my first dog, and he was also my first friend. We did everything together. We played together, we napped together, we even threw up together once during a sickening <laughs> summer road trip. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. What I didn't realize at that time was that Fritz, or more accurately, my connection with Fritz, would be the catalyst for my life's work. And that's what brings me here today. My life's work as a psychologist, professor, and author has centered around one key theme. It's a theme that is central to our freedom of choice and therefore to our personal empowerment and to social and ecological justice. And that theme is making the connection. I'm here to talk about our connection with other beings and with ourselves and with our core values and about the invisible belief system, the ism that disconnects us from these fundamental aspects of our lives. I'm here to talk about how this ism creates a gap in our consciousness when it comes to some of the most important and frequent choices that we make, our food choices, and how this gap causes us to act against our own interests and the interests of others. So I'm here with a goal, which is to raise awareness of this invisible ism to promote personal empowerment and social and ecological justice. So this presentation will be in three parts. First, we will discuss the problem of the gap. What exactly is this gap in our consciousness and how does it obstruct our freedom of choice? Next, we'll discuss the underpinnings of the gap. What causes and maintains this gap that guides our food choices? And what are the consequences of our choices on ourselves and our world? And how does this gap reflect an ism that is a social justice issue? And finally, 
because everybody likes a happy ending, including me, we will discuss the solution to the gap. How can we resolve this gap in order to make more empowered and just choices? And how can we incorporate an awareness of this ism so that we can work to transform this ism that's interlocking with so many of the other isms? So what then is the gap? Now to explain this, I want to do a quick exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you're a guest at a dinner party and the host is famous for her homemade pasta and meatballs. And she serves you a dish that looks like this. And imagine that this dish will not affect your arteries in any way. It's actually not, not bad for you, just imagine. How, just imagine whether you would find this dish delicious or disgusting. Now, for those of you who would find this delicious, even if you don't eat this way anymore, you might still like the flavor of these foods. For those of you who would find this delicious, imagine that you find it so delicious that you ask the host for her recipe. And flattered, she replies, well, the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. How many of you would find this delicious? There's always one. All right. Don't be shy. <laughs> Would you pick out the golden retriever balls and just eat the, I know that made that doubly gross. Pick out the golden <laughs> retriever meat and just eat the pasta and sauce around it. So take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. And chances are what you thought of just moments ago as food, you now think of as a dead animal. And what you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. So what is it then that changed? Right, what changed is your perception of the meat. Now our perception is the lens that we look at the world through. And when it comes to eating animals, our perception is shaped largely if not entirely by our culture. In fact, in meat eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals that they have learned to classify as edible. All the rest, we learn to classify as inedible and therefore disgusting. And so even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures tend to find their own choices to be rational and the choices of other cultures to be disgusting and often even offensive. So what's striking is not the presence of disgust. Disgust is the norm, it's the rule rather than the exception. What's striking is the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the five, six, seven, maybe if you're an adventurous eater, species we've been taught to thought, think of as edible? And perhaps more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? Have you ever wondered why you might be willing to eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings? Leg of lamb, but not leg of kitten. They both come from baby animals. Have you ever wondered why you might be willing to eat beef stew, but not guinea pig stew? Clam chowder, but not frog chowder? Hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs? Have you ever wondered why you might be willing to drink cow's milk, but not horse's milk? Are you working up an appetite here? <laughs> And have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? When it comes to edible animals, there is a disconnect, a gap in our perceptual process. There's a gap in our consciousness. We don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. When I was growing up, I was the picky eater in my family. And in my house, we had a rule that no one could leave the table until their plate was clean. So not surprisingly, this often led to some late night standoffs between me and my mother. My mother would try not to let me out of her sight, and I would wait for just the right moment when she wasn't looking to slip my food to Fritz, my partner in crime who was stationed under the table. And if my mother happened to catch me, I would tell her I was just petting the dog. And she would believe me, because there were plenty of times when I really was just petting the dog. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. 
a pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent and sensitive and conscious as my dog. I never thought about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because, frankly, when I was eating the pork chop, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I mean, sure, I knew that whenever I ate meat, someone had to die for my plate. You know, but on another level, I just didn't connect the dots. I just had that knowing without knowing. I had a gap in my consciousness. And so because this gap in our consciousness blocks our awareness of the reality of our meat, it also blocks our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat. Remember when I told you you were eating a golden retriever, chances are you couldn't help but think of the living animal and feel disgusted. And yet when you believed you were eating the flesh of a cow, chances are you had no thought of the living animal and you felt no disgust. So when we're not aware of the reality of our meat or of our authentic thoughts and feelings about the meat, then we are also not aware that we have a choice, that we are making a choice every time we eat meat. And so this gap in our consciousness robs us of our ability to make our choices freely because without awareness, there is no free choice. For much of my life, I never questioned my choice to eat pigs and chickens and fish and cows because I never even thought I had a choice. No one had ever asked me if I wanted to eat animals, how I felt about eating animals, if I believed in eating animals. No one had ever encouraged me to reflect upon this daily practice that had such profound ethical dimensions and personal implications. Eating animals was just a given. It was just the way things are. It's really striking that our culture teaches us to spend more time thinking about what brand of shampoo to buy than about what species of animals we eat and why, when our food choices have a significant impact on our bodies, our minds, and our world. Our food choices truly are a matter of life and death. And so now that we've talked about what this gap is, we can turn our attention to the next set of questions, which is, where does it come from? And what are the consequences of living with this gap? It was half a lifetime before I started asking these questions. It was 1989, and I had recently awoken to find myself hooked up to IV antibiotics at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston after having eaten what turned out to be my very last hamburger. <laughs> According to my team of doctors, um, Beth Israel is a teaching hospital, so to my humiliation, I was assigned a cluster of young, good-looking interns <laughs> who were fascinated by my intestinal activity, and I'll say no more. Um, and according to the Department of Public Health, which shut down the greasy spoon I'd made the mistake of patronizing, I had eaten a burger contaminated with Campylobacter, a foodborne illness similar to Salmonella. Has anyone here ever had Campylobacter? Okay, some of you know what I'm talking about. Just imagine the worst gastrointestinal flu you've ever had times 10. That's what Campylobacter is like. So contracting Campylobacter was one of the worst experiences of my life. But it was also one of the best experiences of my life. It was a turning point for me. Before I got sick, I had been increasingly uncomfortable with the idea of eating meat, having witnessed on a handful of occasions information about the horrors of animal agriculture. I mean, I knew on some level, that eating animals was antithetical to my personal values. Like most people, I cared about animals and I didn't want them to suffer, especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. And yet, I hadn't been ready to take that information in. So my response had always been, don't tell me that, you'll ruin my meal. <laughs> but the um, Campylobacter really lit a fire under my butt, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> After I got sick, I never wanted to eat another burger or any meat again, and I didn't. And then something interesting happened. When I stopped eating animals, I made the connection. I had a shift of consciousness, a paradigm shift. In other words, I didn't see different things. I saw the same things differently. Remember how different your meat looked to you when I told you you were eating a golden retriever. That's how all meat suddenly looked to me. 
It's just interesting how the gaps in our consciousness only become visible when they start to disappear. And as the gap in my consciousness closed, my mind opened. I wanted to learn the truth about animal agriculture. It was a truth that had been right in front of me, all around me, but that I had been unable or unwilling to see. And I wanted, I needed to understand how, when it came to eating animals, rational, caring people, just like myself, could, in the words of psychiatrist and social activist Robert J. Lifton, just stop thinking. So I spent about 20 years looking for answers, including about a decade of research that culminated in my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And what I found was to dramatically change the way that I and others working in psychology and social justice thought about the issue of eating animals. So to share my findings with you, I want to start out with another exercise. If vegetarian is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the tenets, the teachings of the belief system we call vegetarianism, and a vegan is a person who practices the tenets of veganism, what then do we call somebody who is not a vegetarian or a vegan? Someone who hasn't read my book, please. Thank you. All right. I heard a couple of them. Well, sometimes we say omnivore. But an omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, that can ingest both flesh and plant matter. And a carnivore is an animal that needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. Both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's ideological or philosophical choice. Sometimes we say meat eater. But how accurate is this? I mean, meat eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. This is why we don't say plant eater when we refer to vegans and vegetarians, because we, re we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a deeper belief system or ideology. I'm using ideology and belief system interchangeably here. We tend to assume it's only vegans and vegetarians who bring our beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for instance, because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, which is the case in much of the world today, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. So what I found is that there's an invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. And this is the belief system I came to call carnism. It's the opposite of veganism. Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It's a dominant ideology. It's invisible, entrenched. It shapes norms, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it's also a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without killing. And dominant violent ideologies, such as carnism, need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they're doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now, the primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. Denial is expressed through invisibility. One way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't think about it. We can't talk about it or challenge it or question it. The invisibility of carnism is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. And carnism also keeps its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. And as social critic, author and eco-feminist Carol J. Adams tells us, if the problem is invisible, then there will be ethical invisibility. Now, carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. But before I talk about the invisible victims of the system, I want to do another exercise with you to give you a sense of the power and scope of invisibility. This one is a multiple choice. 19,011 farmed animals are killed in the U.S. every. Now this, by the way, is land animals. If this included fish and other aquatic life, the number could be quintupled. I haven't given you the answer yet. <laughs> 
So it's just the United States. If you guessed minute, you guessed correct. This adds up to approximately 10 billion animals per year. So in the time it took us to do this exercise, 20,000 animals were slaughtered in our own backyard. But think about it. How many farmed animals have you seen? How many have you seen just this week? Really just take a minute and think about this. How many have you seen this month or this year? How many of them have you seen in your lifetime? Just to put this figure into perspective, think about how many people you see out on the street in a given day. Given that the US population of farmed animals is 32 times the human population, where are they? Given that these animals' body parts are literally everywhere we turn, why don't we ever see them alive? We don't see the animals who become our food because we're not supposed to. They are not, as carnistic industry would have us believe, living on happy mom and pop farms. <laughs> This had the label happy cow, and I came to realize that it's more of a creepy cow, right? <laughs> it's that clown effect. It's supposed to be happy, but it scares you a little. Over 99% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates comes from animals that were raised in factory farms, windowless sheds in remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone outside of industry officials to obtain access to. And if you did try to obtain access to one of these compounds, you could wind up in prison, thanks to the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. According to Dara Lovitz, attorney and author of Muzzling a Movement, the AETA states that one has committed the federal crime of terrorism if they engage in any activity that may reduce the profits of an animal enterprise. As Lovitz says, the AETA is fundamentally unconstitutional as it violates activists' right to free speech. So who are these individuals that carnistic industry tries so desperately to hide from us? I'm going to show you a short video narrated by Dr. Jonathan Balcom, animal behaviorist and author of over 40 scientific papers and four books on animal cognition that gives us a rare glimpse into their inner lives. Many of the animals you see here are residents of Farm Sanctuary, which is the nation's leading farmed animal protection organization. Pigs are intelligent, playful, and curious. Like us, they are also natural pleasure seekers. I often kneel down next to one of the adult pigs, maybe Fern or Rosie, lazing in the thick hay of their barn at Poplar Spring Animal Sanctuary. I scratch their heads and stroke their ears to let them know I'm a nice guy. Then I start to rub their belly. More often than not, the pig will make an effort to reposition him or herself, shifting several hundred pounds of weight to expose more of the belly for scratching and rubbing. The simple act says, that feels good. Sometimes they grunt in satisfaction. Their bellies are warm and very soft, and it's almost as much fun to administer the belly rub as it is to receive it. Almost. <laughs> Cows form a strong emotional bond with their calves. For example, shortly after graduating from Cornell University Veterinary School, Dr. Holly Cheever was called out to a busy dairy when a cow mysteriously stopped producing milk. The cow had recently delivered her fifth baby out in the pasture. As was usual dairy farm practice, her calf was taken away as soon as she returned to the milking barn. Normally, a milked cow will produce over 12 gallons per day, but this cow always returned for the evening milking with an empty udder. Dr. Cheever couldn't figure out what was going on, but on the 11th day, the farmer called to say he had followed the cow out into the fields, where he discovered she had produced twins. Having lost four previous babies, the mother cow had made a Sophie's choice returning one of her precious children and keeping the other in the woods at the pasture's edge. Cheever pleaded with the farmer to let the cow keep her twin calf, but he was sent off to a veal crate. This incident invokes a cow's painful memory of earlier loss and a level of complex reasoning few would attribute to a cow. Chickens and turkeys are social species with well-developed vocabularies of calls. Each bird recognizes all the other individuals in a flock by their appearance and by their voice. I remember watching a mixed flock of roosters who had recently been rescued from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. They were happily foraging in the grass when suddenly they all made a dash to a nearby shed. Only as they reached cover did I notice a hawk flying overhead. Chickens and turkeys have specific calls for aerial predators, and one of them had sounded the alarm. 
This is considered virtuous behavior because the alarm caller runs the extra risk of drawing attention to him or herself. Fishes are as misunderstood as they are diverse. Careful scientific experiments show that they experience pain. They also have emotions such as the fear of predators seen here. Fish can recognize other individuals, they have prodigious memories, and they have preferred shoalmates. Lobsters and crabs also show the experience of pain. Some crabs will refuse to accept food and eventually die after one of their claws is twisted off. Shrimp groom body parts that were pinched or shocked and stop doing so after treatment with a painkiller. Though we're still unraveling the mysteries of animal minds, there is no doubt that animals think and feel and that they have rich emotional and social lives. Yeah, so I know some of those scenes were really lovely, weren't they? Um, and unfortunately, Farm Sanctuary is home to only a tiny minority of farmed animals. So in a couple of minutes, um, I'm going to show you another film, another short video, it's four minutes long, that gives a glimpse um, into the, the lives of the 99%. But before I do, I want to just give you a heads up. The video I'm going to show is distressing to witness, and obviously my goal is not to distress you, but to raise awareness. And to do that, I've got to make the invisible visible. I spent a lot of time selecting material that I felt was sufficient to inform without actually traumatizing you. And I want to remind you that the focus of this presentation is ultimately solutionary. So we explore the problem only insofar as to discuss ways to transform and transcend the problem. Um, and I want to encourage you to bear witness to this video, but I know that it's difficult to see. So I'm going to keep the, the volume low and um, encourage you to also witness yourself, close your eyes, block your ears for the few moments that it's playing if you need to, and you should be able to, to block out the sound. Mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. Others are killed by being slammed headfirst into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. Improper stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. This practice is deemed standard and acceptable by the egg industry. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. After debeaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of egg-laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attacks. Those who live to reach market weight are thrown into transport crates and loaded onto trucks bound for slaughter plants. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. They are then pulled across a blade which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. 
Workers subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so-called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. Undercover investigations at kosher slaughterhouses in the United States have documented the routine practice of cutting open the throats of fully aware and alert cattle. Massive trawling nets indiscriminately drag hundreds of tons of fish and other animals along the ocean floor. They are then tossed on board where the surviving fish either suffocate or are crushed to death. Others are still alive when they are hacked apart on these floating slaughterhouses. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small disease and excrement ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. Hmm. Good job. I know this is incredibly difficult to witness. I've seen images like this and this just countless times and it, it never gets easy for me. I want to just mention briefly that <clears throat> much of what you've seen here are standard industry practices and they apply to so-called free range and organic facilities as well. Whenever people see the witness the, the truth about animal agriculture like this, they, they always ask me, Melanie, how is this legal? And I always reply that not only is it legal, there is an entire industrial complex built around this kind of violence and slaughter. Animal agribusiness in the United States is a $125 billion industry. There are countless companies just like this one selling an emasculator, a castrator, as though it were a nail clipper. You can even buy a castrator on eBay if you decided you wanted to which is where I bought mine. Now, before you think of me as a ball buster, let me explain why I carry a castrator around in my purse with me. I, um, I'm on the second year of a national speaking tour presenting my slideshow on carnism, and I wanted to have something tangible to bring with me to show people. And because I'm on planes frequently, I can't bring anything sharp, and I can't bring anything large, so I wound up having to get a castrator. But I can tell you that um, getting through airport security has taken on a whole new dimension for me. <laughs> this is what it looks like. And I have this terrible fear I'm going to be on a date and have um, forgotten this in my purse. And, uh, it's not good for the love life. But this is what it looks like. So clearly, the animals pay dearly for our carnism. But as I mentioned, animals are not the only victims of carnism. Another set of invisible victims are the meat packers and slaughterhouse workers, many of whom are non-English speaking immigrants, documented and undocumented, who can't advocate for their rights, and who have to work in a death-saturated, highly dangerous environment, and not surprisingly, have high rates of post-traumatic stress and addictions. Now, I'm going to share with you just three titles of OSHA accident reports to give you a sense of what these people have to contend with. And this is out of you know, 35 or so I had to choose from. Can you all see in the back, or do you need me to read this out? In the back, can you say, read it? Okay. Employee hospitalized for neck laceration from flying blade. Employee's eye injured when struck by hanging hook. Employee decapitated by chain of hide puller machine. In fact, in 2005, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch issued a report criticizing a single U.S. industry, the meat industry, for working conditions so appalling they violate basic human rights. And our environment is an invisible victim of carnism. According to a recent U.N. report, animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems facing the world today. And, of course, 
We are the invisible victims of carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be the ADA, not a progressive organization when it comes to food, issued a statement saying that vegan diets are not only nutritionally adequate, but they can provide health benefits in the treatment and prevention of disease. We also pay for our carnism with our taxes, billions of dollars a year in meat subsidies, subsidies that have been criticized across the political spectrum as one of the most egregious corporate welfare programs in the history of the country. And we pay for our carnism with our hearts and with our minds. Because to eat the body of another sentient being, we have to block our awareness and shut down our empathy. And empathy and awareness are integral to our sense of self. We, we pay for our carnism with the gap in our consciousness. So we've talked quite a bit about how denial, the primary defense of the system, is expressed through invisibility. But think about it. Is invisibility really foolproof? Is it enough? Of course not. Hints of the truth surround us. The, the palpable vein in the drumstick. The hog on a spit at the company barbecue. Vegan guests at dinner parties. And an endless array of dead animals everywhere we turn in the form of meat. So when invisibility inevitably falters, the system needs a backup. We need to justify eating animals. And the way we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat are the facts of meat. Now, there's a vast mythology surrounding eating meat, but all of these myths fall in one way or another under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. What do you think they are? Amazing. OK, that was, I think, the fastest ever. I have done this with thousands of people over the years, thousands of people. Eating meat is normal, natural, and necessary, and everybody gets it like that. Why do you think we all know? <laughs> exactly. We have heard it all before. So let's briefly look at each of these myths in turn. Eating meat is normal. But what we call normal is simply the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture. It is the carnistic norm. And carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it's virtually impossible to see unless we step outside the carnistic box. So to help you step outside the box, I'm going to do another exercise. I'd like you to imagine that you're back at that dinner party where your host has just told you you're eating a golden retriever. But now imagine that you tell your host how you feel. And she says, don't feel bad. It's OK. The dog had a good life. She was able to run and play. And she formed friendships with other golden retrievers and even some people before she was killed at six months old. Did it make it any easier to eat the golden retriever? So ask yourselves if, if you would be opposed to a perfectly healthy golden retriever being killed simply because people like the way her thighs taste. Why might you not be opposed, or we not be opposed, to the exact same thing being done to somebody else? Carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it blinds us to the fact that humane meat is a complete contradiction in terms. Humane meat is a myth. It is a myth constructed by those in the business of violence to appeal to those of us who would ordinarily never support such violence. Eating meat is natural. Well, what we call natural is simply the dominant culture's interpretation of history. It refers not to human history, but to carnistic history. It references not our fruit-eating ancestors, but their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, we only look as far back in history as we need to to justify current carnistic practices. And to be fair, murder, rape, and infanticide are as long-standing and therefore arguably as natural as eating animals. And yet we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. In the words of author Colleen Patrick Goudreau, do we really want to use the behavior of the Neanderthals as the yardstick by which we measure our current moral choices? <laughs> and eating meat is necessary. Well, what we call necessary is simply what's necessary to maintain the dominant culture, to maintain the carnistic status quo. And here I'll let a picture speak for itself. Can you see in the back? OK, this is how many animals have been slaughtered globally since I opened this slide. 
This is the animal kill counter. Now, of course, a related myth is the protein myth, but as you all know, this is a myth. Did you know that you could be strong enough to lift a car without having eaten an ounce of animal protein in your life? You know, looking back on my own resistance to witnessing the truth about eating animals, I could see how the myths had a tremendous influence on me, as they do on all of us. I couldn't close that gap in my consciousness until I was ready to make the behavioral change that would inevitably follow. And I couldn't make that change until I felt safe enough to do so. I had a lot of fears and concerns. Would I get sick? Would I go broke buying expensive vegetarian foods? Would I have to subsist on a diet of tofu and cardboard? And this last issue was a serious concern for me because two of my greatest pleasures in life are cooking and eating. And what about my relationships? My father was, and he is today, a charter captain, a professional fisherman. My uncle has been an avid hunter his entire life. My Jewish stepmother made the best matzo ball soup this side of the equator. My Italian nana thrived on overstuffing us, full of her lasagna marinara. My half-Lebanese mother served an Arabic lamb dish as a centerpiece for every special occasion. So what would happen if I rejected the traditions that bonded me to my family? What I didn't realize back then was that although change is always somewhat scary and changing ingrained behaviors is always somewhat challenging, this kind of change would also be tremendously empowering. I didn't realize that I would be healthier today at 45 than I was when I was half my age or that I'd be able to cook and eat even more abundantly. And I didn't realize that the deepest bonds with others are forged not through unquestioningly following the dictates of tradition, but by becoming the kind of person who practices authenticity and integrity, the cornerstones of meaningful relationships. John F. Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and neither should we, because the myths of meat prevail despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And they prevail largely because the system is so entrenched. When a system is entrenched, that means it's embraced and maintained by all major social institutions, from the family to the state, that it's become self-perpetuating. It's summed up nicely by a French political economist who said, when plunder becomes a way of life for men and women living together in society, they create for themselves in the course of time a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it. And when we are born into an entrenched system such as carnism, we inevitably absorb that system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat and the animals we eat so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For instance, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we learn to refer to this turkey as something rather than someone. Or to call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a group about which we've made generalized assumptions. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. This is summed up nicely by a quote from a meat cutter I interviewed for my dissertation, who said, I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing with its own name and its own characteristics, its own little games that it plays? Yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different behaviors toward different species. A female meat eater I interviewed told me that she regularly ate a variety of types of meat. And when I asked her if she ate meal, uh, meal, veal, she stopped and looked at me, offended actually, and said this, well, let's just say I came to your house 
and you told me that I had just eaten veal, I'd probably vomit. Like, I have to get that out of my system. And when I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby. And when we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this or like this, someone mutilating their own body to be eaten, and we take no notice rather than take offense. Or we see images like this or this, and we laugh rather than cry. Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar. The mentality that enables such violence is the same. It is the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It is the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals. It is the mentality of meat. And so if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will be doomed to recreate atrocities in new forms. This is why it's critical that we incorporate all oppressive systems into our analysis, including carnism. Eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive ism. Eating animals is a social justice issue. Martin Luther King understood the ways in which oppressive systems reinforce one another. He wisely cautioned that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the opposite is also true. Justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice is not an abstract concept. It is a practice, a practice that can be carried out anywhere, in the streets of a nation's capital, in a hotel, in a courtroom. And we can practice justice on our plates. And so this brings us to the conclusion. What is the solution? Knowing what we do about carnism, what do we do about it? And I'm going to address this question with a question for you. Why do we use carnistic defenses in the first place? What's the reason? Why do we use denial, justification, objectification? Addictions, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because we care. We care about animals and we care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring and the system is built on deception. I've been talking about eating animals for 20 years now and I have never encountered a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animals suffering. So the good news is that carnism is really a house of cards. It's a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents, us. Why else would we need to go through all the psychological acrobatics if not because we care? And so our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth, to bear witness. When we bear witness, we identify with another. To identify with another is to see something of ourselves in them and something of them in ourselves, even if the only thing we identify with is the desire not to suffer. When we bear witness, we empathize with another. We look at the world through their eyes so that when we make choices that impact them, we ask ourselves, what would he or she ask me to do? 
When we bear witness, we make the connection. We close the gap in our consciousness, and we become more empowered because we become more integrated, more whole, more in alignment and connected to our core values. Values such as compassion, reciprocity, the golden rule, and justice. Values that are diametrically opposed to carnism. It's no coincidence that integration and integrity share a root. Integrity, by definition, is the integration of values and practices. We can practice witnessing in so many ways. I mean, think about the AIDS quilt. Has anybody here ever seen that? Amazing, active witnessing. The Vietnam Memorial Wall, the revolutionary music of the 60s. Witnessing can be writing or not writing a check in the name of justice. It can be handing out pamphlets on a street corner, starting a task force. Witnessing can be hosting or attending or presenting a slideshow. Throughout the history of humankind, virtually every atrocity was made possible because the populace turned away from a reality they felt was too painful to face. And virtually every social transformation, every revolution was made possible because a group of people chose to bear witness and they demanded that others bear witness as well. For instance, just consider the countless witnesses, the conscientious objectors throughout history, some who have been famous, but most who are the unsung heroes of social transformation. This transformative potential of collective witnessing is why oppressive systems must deny the truth about the social movements that challenge them. So, for instance, proponents of the movements are are portrayed as biased or extremist when they challenge the biases and extreme practices of the dominant culture. Or they're portrayed as overly emotional and sensationalist when they challenge the apathy and numbing of the dominant culture. And the true power and scope of the social movement is minimized or denied. So despite what mainstream carnistic culture would have us believe, there is reason to be very, very hopeful. The vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is thriving. For instance, since 2008, the number of vegetarians and vegans in the U.S. has doubled. A recent Business Week article entitled The Rise of the Power Vegan says that a, no number, a growing number of America's most powerful bosses have become vegan. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. Ellen has her own website dedicated to going vegan, vegan cookbooks, innovative foods, restaurants, recipes, medical doctors are springing up everywhere. So moving beyond carnism enables us to step into a vibrant, vibrant community of millions of people who seek to celebrate life and cultivate compassion. It enables us to become a part of something greater than our individual selves. So coming back full circle, Fritz, my first dog, was also in many ways my first teacher. Fritz taught me that love, which is the highest form of connection and the highest expression of justice, shouldn't be limited by arbitrary boundaries such as species. To love someone is to respect their being. It's to respect that no matter how different from us they are, they have a life that matters to them. Fritz taught me to be a witness. He taught me that love is a verb. And this is why the goal of my presentation today and the goal of my life's work has been to raise awareness of the invisible system that is carnism. Because for better or worse, we are all participants in the system. And so our choice really isn't whether we participate, but how we participate. And with awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can practice justice and exercise love. With awareness, we can lead more authentic and freely chosen lives and truly become, as Gandhi said, the change we wish to see. Thank you. so much. Thank you so much. 
Okay, if that didn't leave you speechless, <laughs> then uh, maybe somebody has a question for Dr. Joy. Would you like to come back here if you do? That was a very great presentation. Thank you. Thank I you. I think we all have a natural resistance to seeing these animals in these factory farms. What is your response to the new trend to like cowgirl creamery, the family owned farm that sensitively raises their healthy animals, etc. We're seeing more and more of these at the farmers markets and yep. at Whole Foods, places like this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear your response about that. Well, it's a great, that's a great question. Um, I actually have an article that came out last year called Understanding Neocarnism, neo which is the kind of new form of carnism, the new um, way that carnism is being manifested. I think it's positive in that there's a recognition now um, that because invisibility has been weakened thanks to the advent of the internet and so much information that's coming out now, um, the, we need to, we're relying more strongly on justification. And so this, this idea that eating meat is natural or it's normal if it's done humanely. And so it's a good sign. It's a sign that um, companies are responding to people's discomfort with um, causing harm to animals. It's also problematic because this whole entire ideology is constructed now around this idea of sustainability. Um, you know, and it's, sustainability is, well, it's not sustainable to the animals who are being killed, for one. Um, and so I see this as a positive sign, as a backlash against the vegan movement. Anytime a movement becomes powerful enough to truly challenge the status quo, there's a backlash against it. And this is a manif manifestation of that. Um, and I think it's, it's important to dispel the myth of humane, humane meat, but at the same time to recognize that it is the culture's attempt to move in a direction that's more in alignment with our core values. It's a great question. And if I had an hour, I'd answer it for longer. <laughs> Another hour. Yes. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Um, horses are animals that most Americans don't identify with meat they seem like they're animals for pets and for for treating well and yet in November of last year um, I'm not sure if a lot of you are aware but our president very quietly signed a bill to lift the ban on horse slaughter right. for meat consumption mm -hmm. um, it's really hasn't been out there uh, as much as I think it probably should be um, and why is that and, and what do you think the repercussions of that are going to be well, it hasn't been out there in mainstream media, which is interesting but not surprising because, you know, carnism is organized around some very powerful vested interests. So, um, but it has been out there in the topic of discussion among people that are active in the vegan movement. Um, I don't know what the repercussions are going to be um, until, I mean, we can see in cultures, um, taste and the animals that have been selected as edible, they can change over time. I think as people continue to become increasingly aware of the ways in which, um, number one, that they don't need to eat animals in order to survive, and number two, that um, animals are sentient beings and continue to make the connection, I think we will be resisting this. I don't know what's going to happen when it reaches the mainstream, if it reaches the mainstream, but there are people who are speaking out against it. It's one example of the way carnism, like other isms, kind of, it denies or minimizes what's happening. There have been a lot of protests against Against it. They just don't make it to the news. Dr. McDougall. Uh, that was definitely the most challenging presentation to the audience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right, we're going to take about a, um, about a five to ten minute uh, break and then we'll get back. Thank you. <laughs>